Hello everybody and welcome back to OMB Reviews. I am the critic who is a cynic. Hope you're doing well and today I'll be doing a review of the first three films in the Zatoichi film franchise. I think I finally got it correct there but before I go any further please be sure to smash that like button, light up that fire button if you're watching over on Odyssey. It really does mean a lot. Also go check out my website ombreviews.com for more information about how to contact me and follow me on the various social social media platforms all right so I have now been able to watch the first three in the Zatoichi franchise. This is a name that I have been struggling to pronounce for a while, especially on live streams. Shout out to Tina, Empress of the Universe, one of my mods and my Valkyrie, for trying to help me along this path of going through it. But this is a franchise that I had never heard of before until I started going down this path of samurai films, uh, going into Japanese cinema, and almost every single person in the comments, in the live stream comments even, were like, you have to check out Zatoichi. Have you checked out Zatoichi's franchise yet? Because you should. It's a must-see. And I had no idea that it was this actual large uh, collection of movies. In fact, I was looking up the basic Wikipedia article on this, and it's a total of 26 films made between 62 and 89. And a lot of them were made within like a year or within a few months of each other, which I just find, one, pretty amazing, the turnaround that they were able to get on this, but then also, two, very impressed by the fact that they were able to create such really awesome, well-written stories that were also well shot, too, and I thought that that was pretty amazing to see happen. Not only that, but also between the first two films and the third film, they actually switch over to color, with the third film being the first of the Zatoichi films to be actually presented in color. And I thought that was pretty impressive, too, the fact that it was only about a year or so separation between the second and third movie that they were able to actually change in a lot of ways. I know it's not really changing genres necessarily, but it really does change the look and the feel of the project when you're dealing with colors on screen and having to actually be worried and be concerned about that look on screen versus black and white. You know, lighting can be a little bit different. And so the fact that they were able to adapt as well as they were was pretty impressive. So I'll go ahead and talk now about the, the three films that I've seen of the Zatoichi uh, franchise so far. So the first one is The Tale of Zatoichi. This is the start of everything. And what can I say? It's pretty fantastic. So directed by Kenji Musimi, a screenplay by M Minori Inuzuka. Again, I'm probably going to uh, definitely have some issues with this. Uh, it is based on the tale of Zatoichi by Ken Shimozawa. And so it looks like this is something based on previous material, uh, based on at least a character. It says a classic Japanese samurai drama saga is a part of what this is, which is interesting. And what I really like about the character of Zatoichi is, I think, the actor. So Shintaro Katsu who does this amazing job playing this blind man who happens to be a masseur, who is, again, someone who gives massages. You know, it's interesting because up to this point, I've only ever really ever heard, I guess, the feminine masseuse. And so I, when I was reading that, I was like, wait a minute. Okay, yeah, that's right. You know, in the films when he's, you know, referenced as a masseur, I'm like, yeah, I guess that would be like the male version of of what, what a masseuse would be. And so he is a blind masseur. He's a blind person that gives uh, massages. He happens to also also be a part of the uh, Yakuza. He, he is a member of the gangs of the Zakuza, uh, Yakuza, which I found to be pretty interesting as well. But he's also a master swordsman, and everyone, of course doubts him and looks down upon him because he is blind and this all goes back once again to the performance by Katsu who does an amazing job playing a blind character really just again showing the uh, you know showing all of the mannerisms showing all of the different things that would be taken in order to really be able to portray that character well uh, I'm kind of interested to see I, 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 I don't think the actor himself was actually blind based on what I'm seeing at least with this image here, it doesn't seem to be the case. It says that he was an actor, singer, and producer. So that's actually pretty interesting uh, there for them, for him to have been doing that for sure. Um, obviously, he is most well known for playing uh, Zatoichi, I think, at this point, even though he is, is talked about for other things, which I found to be uh, pretty interesting nonetheless, but it is interesting. Yeah, so died in 1997. Uh, again, a uh, fantastic actor. He does a really good job, and of course... 
his job and his role is what carries the entire franchise, right? It is literally his story. It is his tale. And so you need to have a strong actor behind that character in order to be the in order to be able to carry those things forward and so this first film in the introduction to the character I thought was very well done as far as being able to give the basics of the character a little bit of the background of the character as well and also kind of how he is starting to at this point because of the things happening around him of course he meets a woman as well who obviously has an influence him uh, an influence on him uh, I'm trying to find the character's name here Otana Ot sorry Otani uh, who has an influence on him as well and he starts to realize that the Yakuza lifestyle you know of, of killing for hire and things like that really aren't the way that he wants to live anymore it's interesting too because when you first see him it almost looks like he's a blind monk who happens to have a weapon. By the way, his weapon is awesome. It's literally a sword that is hidden inside a cane that helps him walk, and it's able to, because of its size, provide very quick cuts. And that's also something very impressive of what we see here from Katsu, from the actor Katsu, because he really does you know, have these very fluid movements and it's done in such a way where you like, oh, I believe that with this kind of a, a smaller weapon, that the cuts and actions that he's making would totally just be, you know, ripping open stomachs and would just be destroying the people uh, that he is fighting. But he is also a Yakuza, blind Yakuza masseur with a heart of gold, one might say, because obviously he is able to reach out to and try to help uh, various women. There's also a samurai warrior in here named Harate, who he finds out very quickly is is sick, and he has a lot of respect for him, and there's this final fight sequence between them, and, and he feels sorry. He, he feels bad that in that fight he has to kill him because he had met him earlier in the movie through fishing, and they have this really great back-and-forth conversation, and they're kind of showing that, yeah, even though they're meant to be rivals in this story, they could still very much be friends because they both are looking at the lifestyle in a very similar way. They both look at life in a very similar way as well. They like the the peace and the tranquility of fishing. Like, if they could just be fishing all the time, it's something that they wish that they could do, which I thought was, again... A really nice touch here. Uh, the score to this movie, obviously something that we see, you know, uh, very much throughout uh, the films, is done here by Akira Ifu Ifukube, and the cinematography is done by Chishi uh, Chishi, Chishi Makiura. And I thought again, the cinematography, the framing of all the shots was very well done too. As far as any issues with the movie itself. There really aren't that many, uh, except that it was just me getting used to a very different style, I guess, of the uh, the Japanese samurai genre. It's, it's very different than the other, more serious. Not to say that this film's not serious, but there is definitely some levity to it. There's there's some jokes that can happen throughout, especially you know the more visual jokes that can happen throughout this series. Uh, in here, when he first is introduced to the gang, he's ga he's gambling with them, and and he's able to basically <laughs> con con them all out of a lot of money. Uh, through gambling, and so I thought, again, that there was this levity to it that I had to get used to, but it was really good and very well presented, uh, I would say, for the most part. But the other issue that I have is that you have, once again, this is something that, you know, I've seen in several films that I've watched now, the character of Otane, right? So the, the female character who shows love towards him, and yet he rejects her. And the reason why I have issues with it is actually because of what happens in subsequent movies, because he gives in more easily to uh, another woman wanting to marry him later on versus this one. And so I guess one could say that because this is the beginning, it's it's his character being developed. He doesn't feel like he's worthy of being loved because he is still very much a part of the Yakuza lifestyle, but is now starting to question it. And so by the time he meets this other woman, he is feeling that he's ready to finally be able to leave that behind and in many ways does. But I'll get into that when we talk about that specific movie. But the tale of Zatoichi, the first the first film, uh, I will go ahead and give this film an A-. minus. I think, again, it was a solid movie, a solid start, and there was a lot of really good things to be seen about it. It then leads right into the tale of Zatoichi continues. In fact, it comes out the same year. I believe, right? See, uh, let's see, this film came out in April of 1962. The sequel came out in October of 1962, which I just find pretty amazing. And I want to say that the uh, production of this film started almost immediately 
uh, after the fact, it says the tale was released. The tale of Zatuichi was released in 1962. Uh, it was reissued reissued theatrically in 1976. The film was followed by the tale of Zatuichi continues later in 1962. So uh, they probably were, I guess, filming these around the same time. But still, the fact that there was this kind of a turnaround on the films is pretty impressive. This movie too, I was very surprised by the runtime. It was only about an hour and 12 minutes, which for a feature length film is is pretty much on the short end and on the short side. But I thought it was still pretty well done. This one uh, taken over, it seems, uh, by someone different. Yeah, so someone different from the writing and directing team of the first film. And this is uh, Kazuo Mori. Well, I thought did a great job. He d- directed and wrote it. So this one, it looks like, is kind of continuing the story. Uh, the first one, based off of the actual tale by Kan uh, Shimozawa. And so this one, it seems to, again, take the character, but continue the story without, I guess, being based off of any previous material other than the character itself. And what I like about the second film is that it's much more lighthearted, especially in the very beginning. One of my favorite sequences is that Zatsuichi is asleep in this boat, Uh, by which there are a bunch of thugs who kick a bunch of people, a bunch of uh, travelers out of the boat to take it over so that they can get to the, where they're going first and they don't realize that Zatoichi's in the front with his head covered in the front falling asleep and he wakes up and he's all confused and like there's a blind man in our boat and I just I don't know I thought that that sequence was really funny and very well done again that visual humor I thought was was very well done uh, and then also he is able to show his skill to them as well because they push him out of the boat and in the process of being pushed out he's taken the master's sword and also cut him in the eye as well and it's just really impressive just to see um, that kind of storytelling taken on. And so it says one year after the first film, uh, he is now traveling back. So that's, again, as far as uh, the timeline of the story, because in the first film, he kills that samurai warrior, but he feels really bad about it because he had that connection. He knew that he probably could have been friends with this person, but because the person is sick and because the person was hired to do something, um, you know, they were you know, inevitably going to clash. And so he has now Like he promised in the first film, he has returned to this location to pay his respects at the tomb of the warrior that he had killed. Well, obviously, it's a year later, but the people in this area, especially of the Yakuza, remember who he is, remember how he kind of just, you know, up and left them. And so there's a lot of people, obviously, that want revenge on him. Also, we're able to see the character of Otane be able to come back. And now she has been betrothed to a carpenter. And so in this way, Zatoichi is able to kind of have some sense of, uh, some sense of feeling good about that because now uh, he knows that she has met someone that's a good person and that um, that he does not have to feel any remorse about not uh, going forward with that relationship. But again, another film, very well written. Again, a lot more funny than the first one, but again, does get uh, a little bit more serious towards the end as well. Uh, but again, this is all about them trying to uh, trying to find ways to to get revenge on him. It says here, the Yakuza boss of whom Yoshiro had been staying returns to his travels. Yeah, so there's this character of Yoshiro also um, who is in this movie, and then you find out that it's actually uh, his brother. And so it's interesting that his brother is presented in the movie. You also have this situation where you find out a little more backstory about Zatoichi about how he and his brother had been in love with the same woman and how his brother essentially had stolen the woman away from him, but also that they're able to make amends with each other towards the end too. And uh, he actually ends up killing his brother, which I thought was, you know, kind of uh, kind of crazy. It says, despite Z- Zatoichi's care, Yoshiro dies, but only after revealing that Chio is not dead, she left him uh, because he had become a cripple. So uh, Chio was the woman whom they had both been in love with. And so, uh, again, interesting to see that happen here. The ending of the film also is pretty awesome because Zatoichi seeks out the head of the Yakuza there because he is the one who, because of... Um, because of his uh, corruption and because of him being able to convince his brother of these various things, uh, essentially is the one who's responsible for the death of the samurai warrior in the first film and the death of his brother in this film. And so he goes out to see him, and uh, the film ends with him giving what seems to be a deadly uh, striking blow to Sugogoro, who is the head of that Yakuza clan, and it, it ends, that ends very abruptly there, but it ended actually, I think, at a perfect point, even though it's only, again, about an hour and 12 minutes long, so the second film, also very solid entry into the Zatoichi storyline, and so I would also give this film an A- minus as well, and it really gets down to the fact that it does... Uh, 
it does seem to have this clashing of genres, but I think, not genres, but uh, this clashing of form, again, with the comedy and drama, but I think it is melded very well together. Um, I think it just really comes down to how, uh, in the movie itself, there are just a couple of moments that that are, are just not they just don't quite feel right. I honestly feel like since obviously these films came out the same year that this story could have been done at the same time. Um, and so it's just weird to have an hour and 12 minute movie when you could have probably added it to this hour and 30 minute movie and had a pretty good take on the first two films. But still... A solid film, nonetheless, not a whole lot to complain about. And that brings us to the third film in the franchise that I'm going to talk about today, and that is The New Tale of Zatoichi. This is from 1963, and so about a three... <laughs> so it's about a three... Uh, it's a, Sorry, it's about a year later in this trilogy, which is interesting. It says, it's the film, uh, third film entry from the popular Zatsuichi series, completing the trilogy. So interesting here to see that this was seen in a lot of ways as a trilogy of movies, which is why I wanted to group these together. This is indeed the first Zatsuichi film to be filmed in color, and I really do think it changed a lot of the different dynamics of the filmmaking process, because there's just something to be said about film shot on black and white. There's just something about the style, something about the look. And so seeing Zatoichi in color was actually kind of jarring at first because you start to notice things beforehand that you would not have noticed before. Some of the mannerisms that is done by Zatoichi when he's looking around, uh, when he's like barely opening up his eyes, rolling his eyes in the back of his head as he's trying to sense the world around him just feels a little bit different. And I don't know, I, I feel like these films would have been better sor served as all being uh, shot in black and white. But obviously by this time, you know, color films were were the rage and were growing in popularity and so I understand them wanting to embrace the technology and it is a chance for them to really be able to to use that format in a very compelling way and I think that they do a very successful job in this film of being able to adapt the story using uh, the color, uh, using colored film. So once again, you have a new crew of people uh, behind the project. You have uh, Tokuzo Tanaka as the director, screenplay by Minoru Inuzuka. Um, is that the same person? Yeah, so the same screenplay as who did the first movie, so some continuity there before. Again, starring Katsu, who is, again, doing a fantastic job here as Zatoichi. And this one is interesting because now it says here that this is four years um, it says Ichi travels to his old village four years after he stopped training, seemingly without his sword stick, which is disguised to look like a parasol. On the way, he meets a childhood friend, Tamakichi, whose wife and child have become poor. So I thought it was kind of interesting because that obviously he helps them out and, you know, says, well, I'm sure we'll meet again. So I'm assuming down the line in the other movies, we probably will see those characters again at some point in the future. You also here have Ichi traveling on and now Kanbei's brother. Uh, Kanbei was the Kikuza boss who had who he, um, who he Ichi had killed at the end of the last movie. And so once again, you have this sense of continuation between the stories, which I, again, I just really like that the connection, the stories are all connected in this way. And even though it's not one directly going into the other, you know, because either a year or two years later will have an impact on them. I thought it was really cool to see that take place. What is unique about this film, since I don't want to go on too much longer, is that he indeed finds another woman because he finds, uh, you know, he finds his old master and talks to him a little bit, finds out his master is corrupt, uh, that his master is a part and is creating rather a plan to try and kidnap uh, essentially one of his students to try and hold them ransom to get money for one of the boss syndicates that he's working for. And so he finds out about his boss's corruption and also that his boss has a sister who's just turned 18 and is being set up to marry someone that she doesn't want to marry. And there's a great uh, dramatic moment in the movie where she says, why why don't you marry me instead? Uh, and she is just kind of in this position of you're a really nice person and I, <laughs> you treat me with respect. And he is very difficult to accept this right away because he says, you need to know these things about me. I, I've killed people before. I, I've known women, right? So he admits to having lived a very, uh, I guess you could say a sinful life uh, for a very long time. And all of a sudden she says, that was yesterday, today's today. And he makes this promise and this vow to change his life, starting today to change his life around. And when the uh, person trying to get revenge on him comes around, he lays down his sword and says, 
I, I'm not going to fight you. I, I beg for your pardon. I beg for your forgiveness. And eventually it leads to that guy actually uh, doing a saying, okay, let's, let's go ahead and do a, a, a dice game and it'll determine whether or not you live or, or you die. And Zatoichi actually loses it. But because of mercy, the brother of the slain Lord from the, from one of the first films, he decides to let him go. He, he, he decides that he believes Zatoichi when he says he's changing his life. He's leaving the Yakuza life behind and he's going to, to be a better person. He believes him and he lets him go. And um, this, of course, leads to uh, eventually that same person uh, being killed himself by his master. And this, of course, leads to Zatsuichi being put in a position as well, where at the very end of the movie, he is put one on one with his master because it, the plot is foiled and he is exposed for uh, the corrupt person that he is. And so the teacher, therefore, decides to try and attack Zatsuichi, who does not want to fight, ends up killing him. The uh, killing the master and who's looking on from afar is, of course, the sister of the master, the one who he had uh, been saying that he would change his life to marry. And he now shows that he cannot keep that promise, that he is still very much influenced by this Yakuza life, that no matter what he wants to do, the Yakuza life is going to continue to follow him and that therefore he cannot be the man that this woman wants him to be. And so it's kind of this heartbreaking ending in a lot of ways as he walks off alone uh, in isolation uh, in this way. And again, a very powerful movie. And I really do like the way in which in this movie more than the others, it really develops his character as someone who really wants to leave this lifestyle behind and uh, is willing to change and willing to lay down his sword and, and put his life literally at risk in front of one of these warriors, and I thought it was very good for that reason. I will also give this film an A- minus as well, though, because it has, again, all of these great uh, trademarks and has all of these great lines and moments in the movie, and there really isn't a whole lot to complain about. Um, some might be wondering, why don't you just give this a solid A? And, and, and there's a very good chance that I could end up retroactively changing these grades. I just, you know, obviously there's a subjective comp component to it, and there's just a couple of things in all of these movies, and I'm sure I may have mixed some details in from these movies together, um, um, because they are so close in how they were shot. They're so close in how they were put together. Um, again, there's there's some couple of things, I guess, in editing that are, are things that could be a little bit better. But for the most part, all three of these films are completely solid. And so these make up a trilogy in of themselves. Obviously, these films will continue. And I did indeed just start I'm like two minutes into the next film in the Zatoichi storyline. And I cannot wait to see what happens with this story from here. And so what are your thoughts about the tale of Zatoichi, about the tale of Zatoichi continues and the new tale of Zatoichi? And again, I plan on continuing to watch these movies and to give more reviews as we go through trying to do it one film at a time from this point going forward. I know this was kind of a massive video with, with three different re reviews pushed in, um, but I just knew that if I did one at a time, I probably wouldn't get them out as soon as I would want to while these things were relatively still fresh in my mind. So let me know your thoughts about these films in the comment section below. If you like this video, smash that like button, light up that fire button. It really does mean a lot. You're all amazing and beautiful people. Hope you all have a wonderful day. And as always, God bless. Now for a huge shout out to all of my June Patreon and Subscribestar members, Andrew Hoyle, Biffer de Hobbit, Brian P, Dion, Don Bruno de la Mancha, Enrique Evangelista, Father Christopher Miller, hail to you father, Father Damian Cook, Garrett Searles, Inflamed Wood, It's a Trap Productions, Jason Clark, Jacob Juice, Jeffrey Toon, Jonathan Carney, Laura, the Modern Major General's story, Mike Jackson, Mad Mitch Dunaway, Mr. Peabody and his evil twin with the beautiful hair, On to June, Orange Hat Reviews, Out of Step with Reality, Priscilla Hall, Riff Magos, Rosetta Allen, Teresa Martin, Theodore Benden, and rather Teresa Martin is Miss Martin Muses now, Tina Bojan, Tina B., and Washington Madranda. Thank you all very much for being my supporters on Patreon. And to my subscribe star peeps, Fast Reaction, Nosferatu Gatsu, Stand For, John B., Perpetual Punster, Mr. Roy, Glinzer, J. Alex McCarthy Jr., Dean Heiss Slash, The New Number Two, J. Ra, The Beer Guru, Nevanon G. Adams, and ZK Man. Thank you all very much for being my subscribe star members. And if you want your name shouted out at the every at the end of every video and live stream, please consider joining on Patreon or Subscribestar. You also get access 
access at other tiers to things like a bi-monthly podcast, bi-monthly, bi-weekly, twice a month podcast that I do with John the Flick Pick Flickinger, which is a lot of fun. There's also a tier in which you can join me once a month for the Chosen of Valhalla live stream where you all get to at that level, join me for discussions, talk about any projects that you might be working on, or just hang out and have a good time. It's a lot of fun. And also, too, for many of those levels, you also get access to a giveaway section on the Discord server where you get access to giveaways of things like 4K movies, digital codes, and tons of other stuff like that. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, check out the links in the description and sign up over on Patreon and Subscribestar. You guys are all amazing and beautiful people. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and as always, God bless.